Hi, I'm Micah Woods, Chief Scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center. This is the ATC Double Cut, where I talk about some of the content that I've already written about, thus giving it a double cut treatment. And in this episode, I want to talk about a old post that I wrote introducing a golf tournament that I thought was extremely interesting. I'm actually at this golf tournament at a another year of a future iteration of it. I wrote this blog post, I think, which I called a lot more than your average tournament. I wrote this, I think, back in 2016 or 2017. And this is about the KBC Augusta tournament, which is a lot more than your average tournament. It is a tournament held at the end of August on the Japanese men's professional golf tour. And it's very interesting for a number of reasons, many of which are listed in this post. And this post is, I would say, uh, even though it's five years old or six years old or whenever I originally wrote it, many of the things that I wrote about are still true today. And I'm very excited about what's going to happen during this week, this week when the KBC Augusta tournament is held. So I would like to introduce, because I happen to be broadcasting live from the maintenance facility of the Kea Golf Club where the tournament is held. This is in southwestern Japan on the island of Kyushu in Fukuoka Prefecture. That's uh, to the west of Hiroshima, to the west of Osaka, well to the west of Tokyo. The tournament is held at the end of August, and it's really interesting for me. Of course, I'm a grass scientist, and the reason why it's so interesting for me, well, one of the reasons it's so interesting is because it's all zoysia grass, and that's a little bit rare for a professional golf tournament to be held on a golf course on which the tees are zoysia, the fairways are zoysia, the rough is zoysia, and especially when the putting greens are zoysia grass. Now, there are a lot of golf courses in Asia and in Japan with zoysia grass greens, but it's not so common in Japan to play professional golf tournaments on zoysia greens. In fact, on the Japanese men's tour, this is the only regularly scheduled tournament that is played on zoysia grass greens. In Japan, zoysia greens Greens are called kori, and this is a dated zoysia, zoysia matrella. In the rough, the grass is a different species. It is zoysia japonica, or Japanese long grass. The common name for kori in English is manila grass because it's a finer bladed grass that's more typical of what you'd find in the East China Sea, islands in the East China Sea, and then going down into Southeast Asia. Perhaps you've putted on zoysia greens. Perhaps you didn't even know that zoysia could be used on greens. Well, that's why I think it's so interesting this week at this tournament. Because if you have ever putted on zoysia greens, you know that the ball has a very distinctive role. And that distinctive role is caused by the zoysia leaf blades being so stiff. The Leaf blades are so stiff that the ball is impacted by any blade that's out of place or any little bit of grain in the greens. The, it really makes the ball move. And you notice this with zoysia much more than you would with a grass like creeping bent grass or poa annua or other warm season grasses like seashore paspalum or Bermuda grass. So that's one reason just the grasses. I think it's absolutely fascinating to be here and to have a chance to watch how the professional golfers play on these greens, to watch how these surfaces are prepared for professional level play, and to have a chance myself to make some measurements of the green speed and the firmness and so on of greens that are really unique, unique in championship golf. So there's also the media attention. Another reason why this tournament is so interesting to me uh, and why it is so fun to be a part of is, is to see all the media attention that the grass gets. Remember, this is the only tournament, the only regularly scheduled tournament on the Japanese men's tour, Japanese men's tour 
that is played on Cori Greens. And the media gives that a lot of attention. You'll hear the commentators talking about that on the telecast. There are commercials by the sponsor announcing the tournament in advance and encouraging people to watch or to come out as spectators. And they will often be mentioning the distinctive characteristics of this classic grass on the greens. And then there's another thing that's very interesting. And I wrote about this in the blog post also. The golf course superintendent is my friend Andrew McDaniel. He's originally from America. And it is very rare to have an American superintendent in Japan. In fact, the... I don't think there's any other foreign greenkeepers in Japan. And greenkeeper is what a golf course superintendent would be called in Japan. Uh, the the person who's in charge of the golf course maintenance is called the greenkeeper at most clubs. And Andrew is now the greenkeeper and the assistant general manager here at Kea Golf Club, where the tournament is hosted. On the American military courses in Japan, there will be American superintendents, people like Al Bancroft, who's been working at a couple of these courses for many years, and the other American military courses um, in a few other places in Japan, they will typically have American superintendents. But for courses that are actually run and operated for the Japanese market, and that is the world's second largest golf market with over 2,000 clubs, many of which are mole uh, multi, what's the word? More than 18 holes. So there'll be 27 holes or 36 holes or 54 holes, whole facilities. There's more than 2,000 facilities and something now like 2,700 or 2,800 18 hole equivalents. So it's a really big golf market and it's got one, one uh, non-Japanese superintendent that I know of, and that is Andrew McDaniel. So, of course, he gets a lot of media attention also because it's quite strange or unusual that there would be a non-Japanese superintendent, especially on a professional tournament. So the, you've got that. That's a lot of media attention. And there's a lot of media attention on the turf grass. So it's just kind of a, a fun event to be a part of when the golf course superintendent and the grass itself that the the surface that's being played upon and the maintenance work that's involved to produce those uh, excellent core eye greens when that gets a lot of media attention it's it's fun to be here during the week then there's also free beer i understand and although i looked at the map this morning in the past there's been free beer if you're a ticket holder and you come in you can go and get free beer and not just one free beer but multiple free beers so it's quite a lively atmosphere for people who enjoy free beer and i saw a sign on the or i saw a label on the map that said non-alcohol beer and i don't i assume that there's free beer this year but there may also be free non-alcohol beer which would be lovely because that is a nice drink and a very popular drink in Japan. There's, in the past, there's been some free food. There is um, a lot of food vendors around selling some really interesting foods and fun uh, international type of, of international variety type of cuisine that uh, for me, who uh, generally goes to golf tournaments in the United States or in Europe, I'm accustomed to the standard kind of fare that one could have at those types of golf tournaments. But here in Japan, you can get a uh, some things. Uh, I don't even know what they are, but I can find those uh, at these food stands. And then uh, the, the rough itself is interesting. I put a picture in this blog post, greenside Noshiba rough at 90 millimeters. That's almost four inches. And the rough is quite interesting because there's, although this is common in Japan and it's common in Korea, there's not so many places in America that would have Zoysia japonica rough. Um, and certainly in Southeast Asia, it's not common to have this rough. So this is a grass that grows very upright and the golf ball settles down and it's a warm season turf that 
today it was just getting a cut at 80 millimeters and i understand that will be the last cut of the rough this week and then it will be allowed to grow up a bit there's also music for the players so when the players come on to the tee uh, they get to choose a song that will be played so they come out and there's some music playing as they walk up onto the tee for their first shot which makes it also a lively atmosphere and there's also background music in the uh, putting green and ninth and 18th hole area which also makes it seem well for me it's uh it's been some japanese pop music and it reminds me of going snow skiing in japan <laughs> because if you go snow skiing in japan there is often music playing on the slopes and it's that same type of uh, pop music so uh, it gives me that kind of feeling there's also surfing just off the coast or, or just uh just across the road there is a beautiful beach and the waves are rolling in and if it's big surf or or uh, a little bit windy you can hear the waves crashing from the golf course there's also the weather and if you followed me on twitter where i'm at asian turf grass or if you've read many of my blog posts in the past you may have seen me give some reports about how extreme the weather can be and how much it can rain especially sometimes there's typhoons that roll in during this tournament sometimes there has been 700 or 800 millimeters of rain that's something like 30 or 35 inches it's a lot of rain there's been that amount of rain in the weeks before the tournament so sometimes it's very wet sometimes it's very dry it just rained 80 millimeters yet early yesterday morning that is more than three inches prior to that it had been quite dry so it's been interesting this year it's been really dry now there's been a bit of rain coming in and the soils were saturated yesterday uh, or not not it's it's a sandy site so they're not so saturated it's uh, field capacity would be a better way to describe it and it's been a very nice day today and the forecast for the week looks okay but i'm not too uh i'm not going to venture too far and and say that i expect it to be perfect weather because i've seen it go bad here so many times that I really don't know what to expect but it, if it does rain it usually rains really hard and the the course can just get uh, get covered with water when that happens but hoping that the heavy rain doesn't come this year and if we get lucky we'll have had that um, 80 millimeters of rain yesterday and then coming through the week it could be quite good so all probably be sharing some photos and data and other information some reports from the tournament on my twitter account which is at asian turf grouse maybe a little bit on my instagram which i believe is also at asian turf grouse and i may even do a couple more special atc double cuts this week with some updates about interesting things there's i i know in the past HKT48, which is a, a musical group, plays a special concert on the 18th green uh, on Saturday after the final uh, group has holed out. And that's quite a lively event because they are what's called a Japanese idol group and they have a lot of fans. Uh, and so there's a lot of people who are not even golf fans who could be out in the stands and then they'll hold up signs and uh, uh, maybe they'll have a favorite performer in this group because it's I think it's 48 performers in that group and they all dance and sing and um, I, I don't know all the details but uh, they there there won't be 48 people performing but there will be perhaps 12 or 20 of that group of 48 who will be out performing and it's just hilarious to watch people doing a concert on the 18th green and dancing around there's also lots of food and drinks and a beautiful dog ting 
had been sitting right there next to me, but I think the golf course superintendent, Andrew McDaniel, has now taken him out for an afternoon run as we're finishing the first practice round. So that is a post that I will put a direct link to in the description. And that is the post that I call more than your average tournament. And that's where I am this week. And I hope that you will find this as interesting as I do. There's also some turf grass maintenance stuff that I learned about here, like clipping volume. Clipping volume, I was aware of, but I never thought it was useful. I thought it was just busy work and uh, I couldn't really see a reason to collect the volume of clippings. And it, in the 2013 tournament, those data were being collected and I was here and we saw how the green speed got better and better. The ball roll got better and better as the clipping volume was reduced. And then we realized, uh, Andrew and I realized together that maybe if we could manage the clipping volume in advance of the tournament, the green speed during the tournament would be better. And in the 2014 and subsequent tournaments, that's been a focus and it has worked very well. And since then, I've realized that clipping volume can be used for a lot of other things as well, like estimating nutrient use and um, even being used as a guide to how much sand top dressing should be applied. This is one of the first courses that I did research on with the OM246 method, the total organic matter testing, which we've been doing now going on six years here. And MLSN, which is 10 years old now, MLSN is a method for making fertilizer recommendations for turf grass. And specifically, it's a very modern method for doing that. That is something that we've been doing here since 2013 with great results. So for nine out of the 10 years that MLSN has been in the world, it's been implemented at this golf course. So a lot of the things that you may have seen me write about on the blog or heard me talk about in my videos or podcasts, MLSN, clipping volume, OM246, they're things that I either learned about here or Andrew has implemented them here or Andrew has helped me do some research about them here. And uh, this is a special place for me to be because I get to spend the entire week thinking about those new data and reflecting on and analyzing some of the data from the um, from the previous years because now we have a wonderful time series looking at how much sand has been applied how the organic matter has changed over time how much clipping volume has been produced every year in response to the nutrient inputs and those sorts of things so that is something that I just wanted to run through real quick, that classic post uh, to introduce to you where I am right now and to announce that I will be sharing some things uh, about that this week and in the future. So hopefully that puts some of that information into context just a little bit. Let's go through, I've got a huge, uh, no, a huge, no, I've got a large list. Um, of new posts that I have not talked about yet here on the ATC double cut. And I think let's do this sodium and potassium one. This is a question that I received in July and it was about sodium and potassium on a soil test result when it comes back as both a percentage and as a concentration. And the question was this, I quote, Hey, Micah, I'm just looking at the soil test results again. Is there anything to worry about regarding sodium being higher than potassium? And this is from a colleague who had sent me some soil test results and I'd looked at it and I'd quickly said, uh, I don't really see an issue with anything. And then he looked at it a bit closer and he noticed that the sodium was higher than potassium. But I'd looked at those results the previous week and I hadn't even noticed that the sodium was higher than the potassium. So I wondered, did I miss something or 
um, why did why did he say that the sodium was why was he worried about the sodium being higher than potassium when I hadn't even noticed it? So I took another look at that, and it turned out that I had looked at the parts per million result, which is uh, milligrams per kilogram on American laboratory soil test results. It a milligram per kilogram equals parts per million. So the uh, on the greens of that golf course, the potassium was 55 parts per million and the sodium was 49 parts per million. And on the fairways, uh, the potassium was 124 parts per million and the sodium was 84 parts per million. So as I had looked at that, that's what I looked at was just the concentration, the parts per million results or milligram per kilogram results. And what I'd seen was the potassium was higher than sodium, which for Bermuda grass, this is warm season grass, Bermuda grass in a sand root zone. I'm not really worried about the potassium being higher than sodium because you could still have excellent turf with considerably more sodium than potassium. But I probably would have noticed if the sodium was high, and this wasn't high to me at all because it was actually lower than the potassium. So I wrote in this post, I said, that's what I had noticed previously, that potassium was fine, well above the MLSN minimum, and the sodium didn't seem high at all. In fact, as table one shows, and that's what I wrote in the blog post, um, I, I showed those actual data. I said, as table one shows, the sodium is lower than the potassium. And I don't even look at the percentage values on soil test reports. I really don't. Um, so even though it is sometimes reported, I don't even look at it because I'm not going to do anything with it. So I didn't even realize the percentage results, which I showed in table two in this blog post, they actually flip things around to where sodium now appears to be higher than potassium. And on a percentage basis, it is. And I'm going to explain why that is. So if we look at the average value on a percentage basis, meaning percentage of the CEC, potassium now on the greens is 3% and sodium is 4.5%. On the fairways, potassium is 3.9% and sodium is 4.5%. So this is based on an estimate of cation exchange capacity capacity for that soil, which is derived from a summation by summing all the extracted cations, the calcium, the potassium, the magnesium, the sodium, adding those together and then representing each element on a percentage basis. So if you do that, then now with the so if you do that as a percentage, the sodium is higher than the potassium. The reason why this is is because sodium has a lower molecular weight than potassium. So um, for a, a given mass of an element, there would be more atoms of sodium and then more charge because these are ions in the soil. Uh, potassium would be K plus, Na would be, or sodium would be Na plus. When they're ions in the soil, then if we express them in terms of how many, of how much charge is there, there would be more sodium because there's actually more atoms of sodium than there is potassium. So that was interesting for me to remind myself of that because I'm often just thinking of this in terms of mass because I always just use the units of milligrams per kilogram. But if we consider it in terms of atoms and express it as a percentage in that way there actually is more sodium than potassium but it's absolutely not an issue it's not something to be worried about because for any type of grass that is relatively low sodium in the soil and especially for Bermuda grass that is quite low sodium percentages so it's not expected to cause any problem with turf grass performance bermuda grass can perform well even with the actual sodium not the percent but the actual sodium at more than double the potassium so i replied with this i said 
That's no concern for me. Maybe at 200 or more parts per million for warm season grass. I start to ask the question if it might be something to think about. I mean, and by that I mean if the sodium should be something to think about. But the percentage can be misleading. I can't remember ever using, I can't think of a good reason to, except in the case of trying to assess sodic soil conditions, where you'd use 15% or more sodium as a criterion to identify a sodic soil. But I wouldn't be using the Malik 3 extractant, which this soil test was done by. I said I wouldn't use Malik 3 for that sodicity assessment, although I might look at it for further testing in that one case. So this was a very good question from my correspondent, my colleague who was looking very closely at the soil test results and asking if that was something to worry about, but it, it really isn't for warm season grass. For warm season grass, uh, like Bermuda grass, you can have 200, 300, 400 parts per million potassium and on a percentage basis, um, that it would depend how much potassium you have, but on a percentage basis, that could be double, triple, maybe even quadruple the potassium, and the grass would still be expected to perform quite well. Now, if you do have high sodium, there is something that you should be aware of. If you have high sodium, you probably have high salt in general, so you might want to consider how often you're leaching, or if you're leaching to manage salt in the soil. But we're not talking about the sodium specifically now. We're just talking about the total salinity in the soil, of which sodium makes up a part, potassium makes up a part, and there's various anions that go with those cations, because that's what a salt is, is a, uh, a molecule with cations and anions that dissolves in water. If that salt builds up in the soil too much, if it accumulates in the soil too much, it can make all kinds of problems with the grass. But just looking specifically at the sodium to potassium ratio, it's not something that I'm especially worried about. So that was one post that I just gave the double cut treatment. Dr. Frank Rossi and I talked about another one that I also posted in July called the least enjoyable experiment ever. And that's one that you can find as a recent, uh, a recent ATC double cut, maybe two or three episodes ago when I enjoyed talking with Frank about a particular fertilizer experiment that for me was the least enjoyable experiment ever. Let's talk about one more in this show. Let's talk about another one about Japan because I am in Japan now. And this is actually about the Fukuoka prefecture rounds in the month of June 2022. This post is called Golf Rounds and Days Open. And it's something I posted in July of this year, July of 2022. I wrote that Japan has the world's second largest golf industry. It's a big business. One of the many things I find fascinating about golf in Japan is the amount of practical data collected and shared among clubs and among greenkeepers. And this particular set of data is the number of rounds played per month. Now what's interesting is in this entire prefecture, which has 190 golf facilities, so Fukuoka Prefecture, which is in the northwestern portion of Kyushu Island, which Kyushu Island is in southwestern Japan, the, there are 190 golf facilities, and I showed data with it adjusted to an 18-hole basis. But of these 190 facilities, there are a breakdown of uh, nine-hole courses, 18-hole courses, 27-hole courses, and 36-hole courses. So there's four nine-hole courses, 158 with 18 holes, and as I mentioned, there's a lot of multi-course facilities in Japan. There's 21 facilities that have 27 holes and seven facilities in Fukuoka Prefecture with 36 holes. And what's interesting to me is that all these 
facilities, all these businesses, all these clubs share the data about how many rounds they're doing, which allows a lot of comparison uh, for how successful one's business is in comparison to one's competitors. So I thought that's uh, quite interesting. So I adjusted these to be on an 18-hole basis, and the average in June was 3,350 rounds per 18 holes. The minimum, the least busy golf course, had only 815 rounds in June. And the busiest golf course in the month of June did 6,544 rounds. So the average is about 3,200. That's, I don't know. And you compare to wherever you are in the world, if 3,200 rounds is a lot or uh, not very much. But that's the spread is from about... 815 to 6,500. And there's also member rounds versus non-member rounds or guests and this or, or visitors. This is something that was also reported. On average, even though a lot of these are private clubs, there is a lot of visitor play. So the average was about 25% member rounds. And that is about 75% of the rounds then would be visitors coming to play the courses. And the one that's really interesting to me is business days, the days in which the course was open to play. The, there were over 100 of these facilities. Over 100 out of the 190 golf facilities were open for play every day during the month of June. That means no maintenance Mondays. They're not closing the course to allow maintenance. Because in Japan, golf is really quite a business, and the golf courses operate, operate as a business. And when you operate as a business, they find ways here to do all of the essential maintenance, but they do it without closing the course for play. So it's interesting to see that and to realize in this challenging climate that Sometimes the golf course superintendents don't have the ability, they don't have the opportunity to do some of the disruptive maintenance work that would require the course to close to play. The, the median was actually 30 days because more than half of the golf courses are open for play for 30 days. And an additional 49 of those 190 facilities were closed only one day during the month of June. So basically, the courses are open. Uh, you can expect the courses to be open seven days a week, which, which is kind of interesting. I think that has a lot of implications for the types of maintenance work that can be done. And it certainly taught me a lot, which are things that you'll hear me talk about in seminars sometimes, or you may see me write about this sometimes some of the things that I've learned as I travel around the world. And I've learned a lot from golf courses in Japan because the greenkeepers in Japan have to find different ways to do the work, different ways to produce good turf grass surfaces when they can't close the golf courses uh, for maintenance when the courses are open all the time. So that's something that uh, I will probably continue to learn about and continue to talk about as I learn interesting things that that uh, can be shared and applicable in other parts of the world. All right, that was a few blog posts that got the ATC double cut treatment. The Koshiem baseball tournament, the famous high school baseball tournament is on the, the television behind me. And uh, I may go check the course a little bit or I may watch a little bit of that. Uh, as the day comes to a close and uh, we move into doing some more work for the tournament tomorrow. Thank you for watching and for listening. And until the next time for ATC from Itoshima, Japan, I am Michael Woods. <laughs>